It's Friday, as you know. Every Friday, we strive to have a Health Friday conversation. So, a Health Friday conversation today is going to be about cerebral palsy. How much do you know about cerebral palsy? For the next one hour, if you didn't know, you're going to know a lot. If you knew, you thought you knew, then you're going to know a lot more. We are joined by Dr. Michael Mwangi. He is an occupational therapist at the Mamalusi Kibaki Hospital. And Josephine Kamene, who's an advocate for equal health care rights. Josephine Daktari, good morning. Morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to the hot seats of the situation room. Justin, how does it feel? Comfortable? Yes. Very, very good. Comfortable. Doctor, are you also comfortable? I'm comfortable. Very good. Thank you. Now, how we start the show always at the beginning of every hour is we have guests. We welcome the guests. We give them a very nice warm seat. <laughs> and then we give you an African proverb. So this man here, CT Muga, goes to an African country. And then he comes up with proverbs from that country. So, for example, this week he's been in which country, City? Gambia. The Gambia. The Gambia. Yes. So, your job, Dr. and Josephine, listen to the proverb and then think what does the proverb say to you? What's your interpretation of the proverb? Yes. All right? You're yes. never wrong. City? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. A leopard that visits you is the one that kills you. A leopard that visits you is the one that kills you. Dr. What's your interpretation here? Well, I would think that um, when you talk about a leopard that visits you, it's uh, the, the, the one that kills you. I would see, think that it's uh, that the situation that um, you find yourself in probably is what uh, makes you what you'll be mm -hmm. next. <coughs> mm -hmm. I think. Okay, that's an interesting interpretation. Josephine, what do you think? Okay, to me, I think that most of the pain, or most of the of the uh, hard times that we go through, does not come from the people that we do not know. Mm. It really comes from close people, and most of the time, those who we trusted. Kikula <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> nice one. Very good one. So, Dr. Ari, please introduce us to cerebral palsy. What is <coughs> cerebral palsy? Oh, thank you. Uh, let me repeat my name. My name is Michael Mwangi. I'm an occupational therapist mm -hmm. based at Mamalusi Kibaki Hospital. I would like to say cerebral palsy is a condition that actually affects the brain at the early beginning. It is either before, during, and immediately so few, few years after birth. So it is actually divided into three sections. It appears uh, it's it before before that is we call before it birth mm -hmm. i'm talking about before meaning pre mm -hmm. prenatal mm -hmm. that is before and the child is in the in the womb mm -hmm. perinatal during delivery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and postnatal after some few years after birth it's caused by several things mm -hmm. before it is the child is born that is prenatal we're talking about use of substance use of substance and drugs it can affect that nutrition of values mm -hmm. and during birth that's the most dangerous part mm. because if you have prolonged labor, it affects the, 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 the brain in terms of oxygen transfer. We call it birth asphyxia. Mm -hmm. So it affects the brain cells. That's where it comes from. Then after birth, you can have injuries. You can have infections like uh, meningitis. Mm. You can have neonatal jaundice. All those causes can cause cerebral palsy. And then 70% of all the cerebral palsy co um, causes it is based on the perinatal time when you are delivering the child. Mm. It's all 70% of it. Yeah. This period after birth, when you could get, what's the window? Pardon? After to around two years. Up to two years? Up to two years, yes. And what would be causing that? I have talked about infections, things yeah. like meningitis, mm -hmm. things like jaundice, neonatal jaundice. Mm. <coughs> Malaria can cause that because it will affect the, the brain cells. Mm. Yeah. Do you have many who are in that category? Because seventy percent are it's about at birth. Enough. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And then the rest? The rest you can divide it among those other issues. Equally, almost. Almost equally. Okay. But the, then, in the, in the course of the having cerebral palsy, mm. you also have a percentage you has you cannot pinpoint exactly what happened. Mm. Yes, because you go for history, you do all the tests. Probably you can't pinpoint mm -hmm. exactly what, what caused, caused it. Yeah. Okay. So what happens to somebody now after they get cerebral palsy? Is it lifetime? Is it 
what what what's their life like then um depending with the severity mm. we start there if the condition is so severe then uh, you'll see because you see we cannot see the brain now mm. we are seeing the manifestations yeah what has happened with the brain because it's inside our skull you cannot see the skull, the, the, the brain cells what we see is a ma- manifestation movements muscle tone all those functions are affected it can affect either part of of the body or the whole part of the, uh, the whole body so we, we are seeing situations where by a, a person who has cerebral palsy will not be able to achieve some of those normal things that we think yeah. in in course that we think they are, they, are, they are normal because we take things for granted mm-hmm. and we assume that uh, when we go a woman uh, a mother goes for delivery you assume that things are normal until you get a person with third brain damage mm-hmm. so it is it can be a lifelong thing sometimes those who are very mild they will disappear after going through rehabilitation and, and uh, therapy mm. so disappear but those severe cases it's a lifelong thing. okay yeah how far into um a diagnosis or realization of cerebral palsy then do you know how severe it is and can it get more severe as you go along well if uh, after delivery mm-hmm. you see we have what we call apaga scores the scoring, sorry, sorry, the scoring. What? Uh-huh. Score. Okay. It is a, it's a score which is taken the first 10 minutes after delivery. Mm-hmm. You see, it, it is scored out of 10. Mm-hmm. A child who scores below 4, that's a very severe case. And then it also depends with the, if it, we talk about that bother asphyxia, that lack of oxygen in the brain, we call it bother asphyxia. Mm-hmm. If it was severe bother asphyxia where a child cannot cry, you see, when we come to the clinic, we know this mama, mtoto alilia, kati alizaliwa. Mm. That's the first question we ask. Eh? Mm. Totally clear. Why? Because if the child did not cry, mm. that child did not, that baby did not uh, get enough oxygen. So how long did it take? That one caused more severe cause of uh, cerebral palsy. So at uh, that time, that's when we did determine this one is a bit, you see, you look at the upper score, you look at the prolonged time. How long did it took for that child to cry? Was it actually that child was prompted to cry so that he can get, get that oxygen? Mm. So that's what determines the severity talking about uh, cerebral palsy everything you've said and given the diversity of how it manifests mm. i would i be wrong in saying that you can then typify them and say the different types of cerebral palsy exactly yeah the different types mm. it also depends on the, the where the, the actual damage occurred in the brain because you have about four four types of cerebral palsy you have those which, which uh, manifest in terms of low muscle tone mm-hmm. flaccidity that others which are so spastic others just affect the the movement movement when you, you talk about movement it depends on like um, you'll see somebody going like someone who's drunkard mm. staggering it's a taxi mm. so we talk about about the about four types of cerebral palsy yeah some of them very mild others yeah. very severe yeah mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. justin yes you have cerebral palsy yes how old are you i'm um, that really so this has been you've had cerebral palsy since birth yes okay so what is your understanding of this condition that you have at what point did you get to understand that i have cerebral palsy for me because i i was born with it So I've lived my entire life knowing that I have the condition. Mm. And what I know about the condition is that this is just a condition, it's not a disease, and it does not cure. So the best thing to do is to come into, is to come into terms with the reality, accept who you are, and you can conquer anything in this world. Uh, yes. So for all those uh, 33 years, as uh, you were growing up, um, you have of course had to deal with very many things and challenges and you know looking at other children and seeing the other children how you are how they are what role did your parents play in explaining to you why you're different mm. oh <laughs> the funny thing is that even when i was growing i didn't know that i had any issue <coughs> until when the time came for me to join school <laughs> so i been the first born in a family of four My mom was not even aware what disability is and in that matter she didn't even know what cerebral palsy is so she just took me to a normal school in quotes 
So I just went to uh, regular school, let me say that. Mm. And that is when I came to know I, I am different. Because in those brilliant schools, there comes a time when you are in the PE, maybe the teacher comes, tells you, uh, you draw on the ground, maybe you draw a baby or do anything else on the ground. So I could see others doing it with their fingers. But when I tried to do the same, I could not do it. And that is when I came to know that I am different. Mm. And from that, it was now, I didn't, I didn't feel bad mm. or maybe hide myself. I continued to engage with other students and leave my things as just any other kid. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's then when my mom came across her friends who advised her to take me to a special school mm -hmm. when, and she did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you went to the special school, you, did you experience others who had the condition and how then were you able to adapt in school now? So, yeah, when I went to school, you know, when you have not seen any other person like you, you think that maybe you are the only one in the world. Mm -hmm. But when I went there, I was so... Is it shocked or surprised? Mm. I saw people severe than they was. Mm. And so I just remember then my mom telling me, hey, where are you going to see that? Well, I did not see that. <laughs> 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 oh, the yeah. 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 So I came to know many people with different abilities. <laughs> and also those who are severe than they was. Yeah. Yeah. Is it that your mom did not know when you were young, one year, two years, three years, before you started going to school? Is it that your mom did not know? You know, I'm, I'm sure you've had conversations with her since then. Is it that yeah. she did not know at all that you have cerebral palsy? She, she, she knew that I had an issue, but she didn't know that this is cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, when the time came for me to... Kutamba. Mm -hmm. I did not. Yeah. I was using my back to do, to, to close instead of using my hands. Mm -hmm. So she knew I had an issue. Mm -hmm. But she didn't know this is cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Mongi, is this common? Uh, you that see a parent would actually get a baby, mm -hmm. uh, uh, go home, take the child, of course, for uh, immunization clinics, visits, and still doesn't have. Doesn't have information one thing this is a big problem we had had previously mm. and the, the, the awareness was not there so so when you take a, your baby to for your immunization then you get uh, probably a nurse who has not gone through that uh, kabuklet mm. in that kabuklet if you go through the kabuklet the mch booklet you see an, a page where we have indicated which is indicated on how to identify highly identification of uh, um, disabilities. Mm. Look at those things. Mm. Look at the, the physical so that you can be able to refer. Those are it is. Th that problem was there. But I think apparently as per now not so many people go through the MCH for about a month or two months and fail to understand that uh, m my child, despite the fact that I don't know whether it is CP or anything is something which is wrong and then refer. But Mungi, let me ask you this question. Yes, please. There is this manual that is available to health practitioners in maternity yes. hospitals yes. and am i to understand that everyone who is in that hospital and who provides health care is supposed to understand the contents of that book i would say you have used the, the word supposed yes and we are supposed to know yes. every one of us and that's what i've said because probably in the, i work in the public sector yes and most of the times you'll find somebody one person one one health care provider addressing a, 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 say about a hundred people mm. a thousand you expect the, the workload becomes a bit too much for her or him such that there's no that time to go through that thing and go checking every other thing you come here injection go home that's a problem we have but uh, all healthcare providers should be aware and they are supposed to be aware that they are supposed to screen just screening meaning you just go through the weighing asking some few questions at and then knowing exactly what is supposed to happen at what time mm. because she has as she has said she did not crawl mm. so yep. those are some of the things that we see with the cerebral palsy 
they delay in their developmental milestones. You, so, you see, somebody is supposed to know that at the age of three months, a child should have head control. That is, you're so able to raise your head yeah. mm. and be able to look aside. You know, Angalia. Mm. Mm. So, if that is not happening, please, you're supposed to refer to the right people. You see, a pediatrician, an occupational therapist, that kind of people, so that there is the earlier, the better, because the intervention becomes better. When at Mama Lucy, how many occupational therapists do we have? We have seven. Okay, how many patients do you see going through the system in a day? In occupational therapy or in the, the hospital? No, in the hospital. Uh, more than a thousand per day. More than a thousand okay. patients come walking and out. Uh, in in that, that facility? Yes, yes, in that facility, more than a thousand per day. day. And of these people, how many of them require the services of an occupational therapist? There are so many, but uh, probably some of them will, will disappear in between because somebody did not identify that thing. But uh, as we speak now, what we do is that we do a screening, more so in the maternity and then be used neonatal units so that uh, we are able to identify those kids as early as possible mm -hmm. yeah but the, the problem is we have is that uh, we have a very big workload, workload. yes which is a challenge so ideally what is supposed to happen is as the mother bring the child okay. for this immunization clinics yes, yes. there are some questions that the mother should be asked yes. by the healthcare practitioner and when the healthcare practitioner notices something then they should know that there's an issue. Yes. What should they do? The first thing that, if you realize that it's something that has, it is not wrong with that child, that baby, the first thing that you're supposed to do is to refer. We have, um, from the baseline, we have the clinic officers trained in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. Then the pediatrician, the, 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 the CEO of pediatrics will realize that this is a problem. He either refers to an occupational therapist or cascade that one to the, a pediatrician now, mm -hmm. the consultant. So that that uh, that um, coordination is identified, further investigations are done, and then <coughs> the referral system should be the be best thing. And at this stage, yeah. what information is the mother being given? The parent, the guardian, the person who's come with this child, what information are they being given? One thing that's very, very challenging. It's very challenging because um, when you realize that a child has cerebral palsy, you must take the mother or the guardian through a process of counseling first. Because you see, you, you, as, uh, you have to understand that uh, if you tell a mother your child has cerebral palsy and then she asks you what is cerebral palsy, she has never heard about cerebral palsy, yeah. she doesn't know what it is, yeah. then you have to take her through that process, what it is, what causes this, and what are the problems, what is the expectation, what do I expect from, from this child when this condition is here. So you have, the pa pa first person is to take through is that person who is taking care of that child psychologically they are very much devastated so you have to take care of them first before mm -hmm. you even go to the baby or the child mm -hmm. okay um we called you dactari and it was in error sorry <laughs> so who's a, who's an occupational therapist okay an occupational therapist is a professional mm -hmm. trained to take a person throughout life the daily activities of life train somebody in the functions that takes you throughout the, your life let's take for example mm -hmm. um my friend here, yeah. Josephine. Josephine. Mm. Josephine started talking about that she could not crawl. Yeah. So uh, an occupational therapist will use therapeutic techniques to train her to have head control. From from the word head control mm -hmm. to sitting, crawling, studying, and walking. Okay. We are trained to do that. That those are steps in life. After that, this she has to transition from that sitting to the way she is now walking. Yeah. Then we have to, to, to look at, an occupational therapist will have to look at the environment where Josephine is living in. How can we adapt that one to suit her conditions, to suit her lifestyle as an occupational therapist? Now, suppose you go there and uh, have an accident, God forbid. Yeah. Then you come back, you are a driver. Mm -hmm. You cannot go back to your occupation. Mm. Mm. That's where we are talking about. You cannot go back to your occupation. How do you adapt you to go to, through life? We do modification of vehicles mm. for you to still go to continue driving. That's the work of an occupational therapist to look at the, the whole spectrum of life yeah? so that we take you through that s system. Now, we talk about occupations because from the word go, you woke up in the morning. That's an occupation. Mm. From the time you wake up, how do you go to the bathroom? Mm. How do you put on your clothes? How do you start now preparing your breakfast? Mm. Those are occupations. Mm. So if something happens in between, 
there must be modification and adaptation of the environment through guidance of an occupational therapist so that you can feel, uh, live a, a better life, more fulfilling than when you have those other conditions. Mm. Yeah. So when you went to school, Josephine, and you went to a special school, at what point did you know what exactly your condition was? Uh, I think uh, it was uh, after uh, a very long time because when I went to school afterwards, <laughs> my mom took me to assess medical assessment, and that is when I, I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. <laughs> that is when I came to know about cerebral palsy. I was so eager to know to, to dig deep what really is this condition. So I, I would just, I was so curious, I would just went ahead to read more about it, mm -hmm. what it is, and see yeah, how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because this is something that you cannot change, it is here to stay. Mm -hmm. So you have to just adjust and be you. So you had to be moved to a special school? Yes, I moved to a special school. Okay. What did you find there that was different from the conventional school? Here we had people from different uh, communities with diverse disabilities. And that is when I came to know that, not that I'm alone, I'm alone in this world. We have different people with different impairments. And we just la I just learned to love and accept who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when school closed mm -hmm. and you went back home, did the other children have any understanding of the condition that you had? Uh, when I when the school closed, I, from, I don't think the children would understand mm. what this cerebral palsy is. But the best thing, we maintained our relationship. We were friends, so they did not leave me or maybe see me different. Yeah. If it is plain, they could involve me. Going to fetch firewood, I could go with them uh, and doing everything like they were doing so they could involve me. They did not um, uh, discriminate me in any way. Mm. Yeah. You know, there's an argument that has been made about integration schools yeah. and uh, having special schools or integrating schools. And that's why I'm leading with this question. So when you're in the special school, you're here with other children with different disabilities. Yes. So even your playtime and all, they're different. Yeah. And then you come uh, during holiday mm -hmm. and you're finding children who some have disability, many don't have disability. But you're used to three months of a situation where you're dealing in a certain way. And now the environment is changing, as Michael was telling us. Why are you having those challenges of adjusting, like maybe the first week of holiday, adjusting to this home environment? Uh, for, for what I, I probably I did find it difficult because it's a life that I already used it to. But you know, it comes hard for you if at all you have issues with your self-esteem. If your self-esteem is high and you know who you are, then that will not be a challenge. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's an important part, Siri. Yes, you, you're the first born in your family. Yes. You have three other siblings. Yes. Talk to me about how you relate to your siblings. For me, in the family, even after um, they all know that I have the condition mm -hmm. and that is not take away. My Lord, as yes, they are elder sister, mm -hmm. so I'm their deputy parent. They will be what I say, yeah. and they know that I'm their sister, so they didn't treat me differently. Yeah. I, I think we grew up very well, mm -hmm. interacting very well with each other, yeah. and nothing you did change. If it is duties, we are called duties equally. Mm -hmm. If I can do this, then I'll do it. Mm -hmm. that, the one that I cannot do, then they can help me in, in doing it. Mm. So nothing really changes. They know that I'm there. I'm the assistant, despite everything. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting, um, Josephine, because you obviously today are a champion yes. for um, uh, people who live with cerebral palsy and saying, you know, you can be normal. It's one of the things that you said, that you can lead a normal life. Yeah. Um, how did the <coughs> education that you received 
or that you, and you continue to receive help you in dealing with your siblings for example with your family with your friends <laughs> from now interacting with different people uh, from different uh, diversity so <coughs> that learns that the most important thing is just to focus on what you can change Leave alone what you cannot change and just to that situation and everything else will align according to how you want it to be. You know, the best thing to do is if you have a positive mindset, mm -hmm. then you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. How far in school did you go? What's the highest uh, education you College. Mm -hmm. Up to college? Yes. And then what do you do now? For now, I'm a disability inclusion advocate. Mm -hmm. I run my own organization. I serve at an uh, at international uh, organization known as Association for the Physically Disabled of Kenya. I a board of directors mm -hmm. representing the youth. Yeah. I see. And you said you are an advocate for equal health care rights. Yes. What's that? This is, you know, when we talk about human rights, health is one of which every human being has a right to dignified quality health care. Mm -hmm. So if this part of anyone having an uh, impairment or that a disability, you have the right to access health care without any discrimination, without being seen as a burden. Yeah. And this is something that it's not really happening mm. when it comes to persons with disabilities. <coughs> like, for example, you go to, uh, to a healthcare facility looking for maybe contraceptives and you have a disability. You can go ask for, for example, I can go looking for a CD, that mm. is a condom. Mm. Then somebody will ask you, just which way you will need it. Mm. Oh, no, they can ask that question. <laughs> and yet, you know, you, you really know. You yeah. know what it is and for. Yeah, you know the purpose of it. <laughs> yeah. And not simply because. I have a disability. <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead and ask me why do I need it? Yeah. So what, that, what kind of a question is that? <laughs> so, and that again, another challenge that we pass on to the disabilities encounter is when accessing maternal health care. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mention to you, I'm a mother of one. Nice. So when, when, I, was, um, when I was seeking for and um, maternal services, it was not easy. Because you see, I don't know if the child will tell us here. I don't know if in nursing or maybe when somebody is doing medical, I don't know if there is a unit whereby they are taught about various disabilities. Mm. Because the questions that to get in there are not so friendly to the ears. And when you answer them accordingly, they see you as an adult person. Yeah. So for me, I think, uh, for me, accessing maternal health care was a big challenge. And that is why I use my, my experience as a health to change the, to change the situation. Because I know my experience was, I want to feel that, that experience for, for me to, to be allies. And the voice, those who cannot visit, those who cannot voice their, their own issues mm. due to maybe fear or maybe lack of, maybe they don't have confidence in them to share their experiences. Yeah. You then, will be their voice. I, I am. Very good. <laughs> yes. Article 43 of the Constitution of Kenya. Every person has the right to A, to the highest attainable standard of health, which includes the right to healthcare services, including reproductive health care. This is a right in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. So yes. when I, I'm happy when I hear you say that, you know, you are advocating for equal health care rights. Yes. Because this, it says every person, yeah. every person, whether you have a disability or not, you have a right to access this. Do you find, Mwangi, people not getting access to these rights? Is it an attitude issue, a lack of awareness issue? Let me start issue? by saying that uh, actually what she is saying cuts across our, our, our community, our society. 
and uh, the people who work in those facilities are part of our society. You have that attitude that, that uh, you see. She has mentioned a very sensitive issue where you go for services, maternal services, and somebody asks, yeah. That's a yeah. question that yeah. asks. Sure. Mm. Mm. Those are the, I know I, mm. I've come across, I've worked for several years, seven, so many years in that field, and I, I know the, the questions that these people come through. It's because our society generally has refused to accept and move on and accept these people that, apart from having these challenges, they are still human beings with their rights. So, like uh, she has said rightfully, that uh, you go to a maternity, like, for example, last, last year but one, mm. um, we had a deaf mother in the maternity. Mm. And because deafness is one of the disabilities that we have, and um, it is not seen, not the way now we can see Josephine. So, you see, when you look at Josephine, you can tell something. But for deaf people, you see, you don't see it. Eh? Mm. So the mother is there in the maternity, and then somebody is doing the ward route. And I was a mama. You see, the mother cannot of hear. Of course. So they went and they said, ah, ikifika tu ataitana tu the And then the mother delivers there because she cannot be able to. Go. There was no communication. So what she, she's saying is uh, somehow there, and uh, they supposed to be eliminated because through creating awareness that these people and actually going to what you have said in our constitution making sure that we, we follow our constitution these people all of them all of us we have our rights to be accorded dignity when we are having all those issues mm. yeah but uh, if i may ask the question how do you get people to be sensitive enough to understand that the fact that someone is different from you doesn't make them less or more of a human being than you and how it is you treat people well the same because look at our country yeah. and look at even the discussions we're now having about politics it has nothing to do with disabilities but that discussion speaks of a greater disability that we have <laughs> because if you are willing to treat people differently simply because their community is different from yours. Then someone comes with an infirmity that is not of their choice and it's physical. That is what makes them different. That's all. Now, how do you get someone, how do you get people to be accommodative? Sensitive enough to be accommodative and to understand that perhaps a little care and attention. We are sensitive to little children. We know the needs that little children have. We handle little children well. Now, this person who is different, because that's all, they're different. Circumstances, situations have made them different, and you have difficulties. Even if you're overloaded, because public hospitals, the workload that you people have, it's abnormal. It's abnormal. Yes, it's, it's, it's abnormal. Mm -hmm. And mistakes will be made simply because of that. But how do you ensure, beyond the advocacy work that Josephine is, uh, Josephine is doing, how do you make people who work within our health system understand that specific need of being sensitive to these differences? Um, I would say, for example, in Mamalusa, where I work, huh? we have created a system whereby we, are, we, call, we call them CMEs continuous medical education. You'll call this person from this department, this one from the other department, you give them a talk on how to identify, how to deal with, and how to refer these people, and how to treat them. For all the cadres, now, it's not occupational therapists or people who are dealing with uh, rehabilitation services. That's one thing. The other thing, I, I, from Mamalusi, the way I know about it, we have also, I've talked about a deaf person. We have uh, employed inter sign interpreters. Mm -hmm. for those people so that they don't have those challenges when, they, when a deaf person comes and then he, the, the person is diarrheaing is doing it, all those other things you must get that information from that person how yep. do you get it you must get somebody to interpret for them that's what is happening in mama say we have two two cmes compulsory cmes okay they are not compulsory but we advocate that every department should set somebody once in a month so that actually we, we raise the awareness. And another thing that we also do is giving talks, even the, at the MCH and those other departments. You go there as a person who is, who is dealing with people with disabilities and then you give a talk on how to handle these people. 
so that somebody will not be misadored and then raise that issue of dignity being denied or that right mm. being denied for that person just because he's different from us yeah yeah so just you know you're 32 one would assume that uh, do you still do you, do you still go through therapy right now and is it as often as you did before uh, right now i don't go for any therapy mm -hmm. uh, because you know therapy is just there to help you uh, just to maybe stabilize you mm -hmm. but at the end of the day there is no cure yeah so why can't you just be you accept that this is a fact this is how i am even if i go to therapy i cannot change much so as far now i don't go for any therapy okay yeah what are some things I mean, now you're, ad you're an advocate today yeah. for understanding and championing rights. What are some things that you, you look for or that you <coughs> hope, and that folks who are living with disability, that you hope would change? What are some things that are challenges today that need to be addressed? I think when we start talking about the challenges, we can talk the whole day. Mm. But to just pinpoint a few, yeah. uh, what I want, I would like to see more so in our um, health facilities, if we can have a, 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 a what do you call it, if we can have a, a toll free line, mm. whereby, whereby if a person with a disability goes to any health facility mm. and faces any kind of discrimination, yes. they can call or text for, for free mm. and report, report to the matter. Yeah. And why am I saying this? This is because, you know, some of us may not have that courage to come and speak. But if it's a call, I can just make a call. As the comfort of my home, yes. I can as well as text, and somebody can hear me, and I can get help. Another thing is, why can't we also have a special consultation room mm. for people with disabilities, mm. specifically for them? I know we are advocating for inclusion, but this is not to me that when we have our own uh, consultation room, we are we are uh, we are excluding ourselves. Yeah. No, we just want to be to be safe and also to get the quality services that we deserve. And another thing that I would really like to do is to create awareness in these hospitals because we find that most of the health practitioners have no clue mm. about disabilities. Mm. If they know, they just know that having a disability, <laughs> you, you have to be on a wheelchair. Yeah. That is what they know. Yet, we have other, other disabilities that they are not even considered. <laughs> and you, like, when you talk about disabilities, we have lost disabilities which are underrepresented. Talk of a person who is deaf blind. Talk about people with cerebral palsy. Talk about people with second social disabilities. Yeah. And they are not visible. Mm, they yeah. are not visible. Yeah. Mm. You said you had uh, an organization that you run. Yes, I am. And it's specifically for people with cerebral palsy. Well, uh, the large number is for that. Okay. Yeah. Is there a database for the number of people we have in this country who have cerebral palsy? As 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 for now, you know, mine, mine is just a baby organization. Yes. We are yet to be there. We are yet to get there. Mm -hmm. We don't have funding as for now. Yes. But in future, mm -hmm. that is something that I'm, I'm looking forward to. How many members do you have so far? So far, I have I have. 15 members, mm -hmm. oh. only that, you know, due to um, some financial constraints, you cannot involve many people here, you cannot uh, give them the, 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 the right services. I just want, I just, I don't want just to be there, just to be there. 
I just to, uh, just want to, uh, to add value. Yeah, to add value and be of great impact in their lives. People and who may have missed this, please yeah. say in the name of your organization again and where oh. you're based. My organization is called Able Rights Africa Society. Able Rights. Able Rights. Able Rights. We are able to rise yep. up and do anything right. Mm. Yeah, Our Able Rights. Yeah. Able Rights Africa Society. Africa Society. <laughs> yeah. Where are you based? Where is your office? <laughs> I'm based in Wayaku, that is Mountain View. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and if people would like to, you know, engage with you, maybe offer any kind of support, you know, you may want. Uh, somebody who I would like more occupational therapists who can come and say we can offer our support through Eborize or any other support, how would they reach you? They can call me, just call me direct to my number, mm. which is 07 11 123 024. Right. Yeah. You know, there are various structures and layers that I was thinking about from the government level there's a Ministry of Labor and Social Protection there's a National Council for Persons with Disability mm -hmm. yeah, and cascading all the way down to the counties from your experience do they read the same book let alone being on the same page personally it depends but my answer would be if I was to to let them the ones that I've mentioned, I think I'll just give them not, not more than 50%. Why? Because you see, when, when it comes to representation, you find that somebody is sitting somewhere in the name of representing people with disabilities, and yet they don't have any form of disability. Yeah. So how then will this person be able to articulate my issues? So you notice a huge gap. Huge gap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big ones, big ones. So which day does the world mark World Cerebral Palsy Day? Like it will be on Sunday, the 6th. This Sunday? Of, yeah. The 6th. Yeah. Are there any events organized at any level? I know there are some, uh, but I've not heard of the international ones. I uh, you know some organizations have arranged some events mm. to, to raise more awareness on, on this condition. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Just been very, very um, interesting story. People have said you are courageous, you're good, you keep fighting that good fight, keep raising awareness. Keep advocating for access to healthcare and for everyone. Everybody should have equal rights to accessing healthcare. Sure. And that's what you do on a daily basis. Michael, as well, thank you very much for joining us today. Mm. And the work that you're doing at uh, Mama Lucy, say hello to the other six I occupational mean, therapists I mean. and all the medics there and the ones that you engage with and interact with even outside of your facility. The work that you do, keep doing it. Indeed. Thank you. Sir. And thank you for joining us. Michael Mwangi, occupational therapist at Mama Lucy Kibaki Hospital, and Josephine Kamene, advocate for equal health care rights. They've been our guests yes. in this Health Friday conversation. Say something. Okay. Now, as we mark the World Cerebral Palsy Day on Sunday, I just want to pass this message to any person out there who has a child with cerebral palsy, and they are hiding them in their houses. Let them come out. Tell them interact with other people in the society because you never know. You, they, you never know the future of that child that you are hiding. Okay. Let them come out. Just let them be like any other people. And also, <coughs> just what we need to do is persons with the cerebral palsy. We don't need sympathy, mm. we need empathy, empowerment, and opportunities. So just. Don't, don't feel like you are alone. And what I know is that you, you are the best version of yourself. Come on, clean, come on, clearly, come on, bold enough, and conquer the world. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's well said. Those are the best final words. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.